Microsoft's done it again. They've open sourced another project. Oh, is it big this time? I, I think so. Okay. Uh, let's see if we can figure it out. Don't tell us what it is. I got one hint for you. Okay. Part of the reason Microsoft says it's open sourcing X uh-huh. is the changing state of work. Oh, it's probably something to do with Teams then. That sounds very Teamsy. There, there may be a Teams connection. Hmm. Have they open sourced something with Skype that wasn't open sourced before? That's my guess. You boys have a guess? You got anything? I think it's an open cookbook. It sounds like maybe that's the state of work that's changing. I'm going to go with open sourcing the Windows kernel. Whoa, that's bold. That would really change the face of work. That would really change the industry. That would be history right now. I wish. All right, so what is it? Uh, had a 1500 3D emoji sound. <laughs> <laughs> emoji <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome back to your weekly Linux talk show. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. My name is Brent. And my name is Alex. Hello, you handsome devils coming up on the show this week. Well, we blew it. We knew it was going to happen. We warned you this was going to happen. This is your chance to say, told you so. Our little server, our humble garage box, has died again. Join us this week as we attempt to save our little zombie server Bring it back from the death. And this time we may be looking at data loss. So we'll lay out what we're going to do in the future and our plans going forward. Then we'll round out the show with some great JB news, some boosts, some picks, and more. So before we go any further, let's bring in our virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello, hello friends. Hello. Hello. Hello, 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 Chris. Hello, Wes. Hello, Alex and Brent. Hello. Hello, Hello, on air. Hello, quiet listening. We offer both to our Mumble Room. If you'd like to just join and get a low latency Opus stream, you absolutely can. And of course, you're always welcome to get in that on listening and share your thoughts with us as we go live. The only thing we do is we just kind of like check to make sure you got a mic that works for us. And as long as it passes the uh, sniff test, which is actually a listen test, uh, we'll put you on air and you can get in that virtual log. And of course, you can always jump in. Just tag me in the chat room, and I'll try to work into the conversation. Sometime, you know, eventually Mumble will get those those smells via wire, but we're not there yet. I have been using the heck out of Tailscale this weekend. So go over to Tailscale.com and say good morning from Linux Unplugged, would you? Tailscale is a mesh VPN protected by WireGuard. Get it on any device in seconds, and I mean it. Mobile, ARM device, x86 box, VM, VPS, do it. Build yourself a mesh network with WireGuard. We love it. It'll change your game. Go say good morning. Try it out for 20 devices for free at Tailscale.com. Yeah, I wish you'd stop making me time you setting up Tailscale. It's getting old. You're, you're fast. I get it. It's fun. It's fun. All right, so let me take you all back in time a little bit. Years ago, we identified that sometimes there are just certain jobs that work better locally. Perhaps it's an old archive of your past productions and you want to save the raw files Maybe it's movies you've backed up via the DVD or the Blu-ray. Love you, MK, make MKV. Oh, or maybe it's just something that's really not something that your team needs access to very often. So it just doesn't make sense to store it in the cloud. My friends, enter in our legacy server hardware, which we have been running out of the garage here at the studio since about 2014-ish. We bought the box used at the time, and it's been serving a lot of great little duties for us. Then within the last year, we had a couple of very generous audience members donate us brand new used server hardware, new to us. And we jumped into action and moved some of the services over. (laughs) It's been a process, an ongoing process, you might say. Yeah, and we've gone through several summers where this box gets really hot, and we've tried to come up with various solutions because it is a garage that the afternoon sun hits and every now and then I pull in there with my hot car too. And so sometimes the ambient temperature can be 95 degrees. So we've come up with various strategies over the years to try to accommodate for this high temperature, less than ideal production environment. We get the palm leaves. We take turns in there. It's rough. So I've set up uh, this year. uh, What I did was like a whole air cooling system. I created a holistic approach to my temperature management, Wes. I I cracked the garage door. Right? Okay, all right. And then I set a box fan in the doorway. Oh, that leads now we've to got the, some. Okay, we've got yeah. you know outside. Air we've flow. got airflow. These are good ingredients. Then further down the hallway, I set up 
a second Bucks fan. And then for like the real like cooling like finality piece, I open the back door. So I create a, a cross breeze through the entire house. It creates a wind tunnel that sucks the hot air out of the garage and vents it out the back of the studio. And it actually does work to a degree. And it's ridiculous because um, a cat came in and pissed in the garage. As a result of this. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the, the traditional hazards that uh, most servers encounter. No. <laughs> and and this will come into play later. Um, also, there was a lot of, you know, when cotton trees bloom and there's like this cotton that goes in the air in the Pacific, yeah. it's like it's snowing for a day. Well, a lot of that. Came into the wind tunnel, oh, Chris, <laughs> and so the entire the entire garage got covered in cotton flowers. Though. Rolling around in the cat piss, <laughs> getting in the server, getting stuck in the cat piss has really happened. So it's coming in. I'm picturing this cartoon with you know the chicken that falls into tar or something, and then people throw feathers at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Then Levi got in there. Fast forward uh, to last week, Thursday. I realized it's getting hot again. And Not even that particularly hot. Just no. kind of back right. to hot. Hot enough that the garage is getting warm. And so my protocol is around 1, 2 o'clock. Right about now, actually, as we record, I would shut the server down because the temperatures are just getting too high. And we don't have a better solution than that with what I've done. And I would shut it down, and then we wouldn't use it for a bit. So I migrated a couple of uh, of more essential services off each individual server up onto Linode, and I kind of kind of spread things out. So like certain batch jobs are happening on one server, like the the Plex and the Jellyfin Media's happen on one server. Like I've kind of spread the load out a little bit. So if one box dies, not everything goes. And then I would shut them down in in like uh, right about now. And then the next day in the morning, I get in about seven a.m. and I turn them on and run them till about one p.m. You know, let them get caught up on their work and whatnot do their backups. And so Thursday evening, it was a busy day and I didn't make it out there till like four o'clock. And I get out there and it's 92 degrees in the garage and all the servers are going. So I go to each one, I shut them all down and I go to our oldest server. The one that has like our historic projects on it, the ones that go back from the very beginning of time and the one that has all of my media library, you know. which Chris's private selection. 70, 80% I've hand ripped, right? Like pride has gone into creating these rips. Funny enough, almost like a weird, like movie foreshadow the day before, I'm not even kidding you. Hadia was like, should we just throw away all this physical media? Cause I've got like <laughs> crates of it under the server of physical media. And she's like, we don't watch DVDs or Blu-rays. Should I just like sell this or get rid of it? Like, what do you want me to? I'm like, I don't know. Let's hold on to it for a little bit longer. I like having the source copies. Let's hold on to it for a little bit longer. That was the previous day. The next day I go out there. I go to do a halt, you know, like a pseudo shutdown kind of a thing. And it tells me the binary cannot be executed. That's a good sign. Just always a, a great sign that your system's working normally. So then I, I have my laptop. So I fire my laptop. I go to SSH in. SSH connection refused. I'm like, well, the box is up. I'm standing right here. So I do the control delete, you know, the six times, and it starts to reboot, and I get cannot unmount, and it's this CFS path, cannot unmount this CFS path, cannot unmount this CFS, and it's all screen after screen, ZFS error, ZFS error, ZFS error, ZFS error, and then cannot execute shutdown. So I shut it off, and it's too hot, and I'm like, I'm not going to stand out here in 90 plus degree weather and troubleshoot this thing, and I'm not going to run it in 90 plus degree weather. So I shut it down Thursday night. I got in my car and I left and I went home and I was like in a bad place. I was like, oh, just mostly because even if I could re-rip all of that stuff and even if I could reset up the server, like how many days of work am I looking at? Right. Just that. Right. I was sitting with like, oh, my God, this is going to be weeks of work. Right. And I so I get over it. I get home and I think, well, I'll go down there tomorrow, Friday and boot it up. Get like get it going off a USB disc. Get the lay of the land at least. Yeah. So uh, that was sort of my mindset. I was like, maybe it'll be all right. I'll get in there, see if the ZFS array is fine. Maybe it's just the boot disc that failed because that is its own separate disc that is super jank outside the case, not properly cooled. <laughs> oh, this keeps getting better. <laughs> it, it was like not a great setup. So I figured if there was going to be a point of failure, that's where it was going to fail. 
So Friday morning, I come out really kind of early, like 7 a.m., because I had an 8 a.m. call, and then I had a, a 9 a.m. recording, and like I knew like I had, did not have much time to look at this, but I thought, I'll get out there while it's still like 65 degrees in the garage and get this thing booted. It's the next morning. I've been standing here for a little bit. It's still pretty early. I want to do this while it's cold out, but I've been just trying to strategize and honestly kind of reflect on what I'm going to do if this thing doesn't work. Like after I press this power button, I'm either going to have a massive pain in my butt or everything's going to be fine with some logs I need to review. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on and then I'm just going to listen. I suspect maybe the OS drive has died, but we'll see. Here we go. All right, everything's coming on. Monitor's powering up. Drives have lit up, no red lights yet. I'll be closely watching the both the post boot screen and also, of course, once the OS starts to load. Just kind of in that window right now, where I just have to wait. The screen hasn't turned up, I just have to wait. Come on, screen! Show me a post! Show me a post! Ah, here we go. Okay, no BIOS errors or uh, IPMI module error or USB controller error. The disks are all passed through, so there's no... Con I wouldn't expect any kind of controller error, but we'll see. Oh, there we go. Oh, that moment. Okay, we're getting to grub now. Oh no. Reboot and select a proper boot device or install boot media in the selected boot device and press a key. I think our OS drive is indeed dead. I'm touching what, which, which I, I think this is the OS drive. It's hard to tell, but I don't think it's spinning. <sighs> Better than the array. But man, what a pain in the butt. So at this point, I'm pretty sure the date is probably good. And what I'm thinking is I'll go grab Ventoy. I'll boot Ubuntu 22.04 because it's got built-in ZFS support. Sure. I'll get SSH going on this thing. And then we'll get it restored, right? It's like not ideal, but this seems like something we could actually recover from. And of course, I ran out of time and I had to go... <laughs> <laughs> to record and do a do a call, which was I was totally down for doing because uh, we're we're working on some great swag for the uh, West Coast road trip. So I was like, I had to go to take care of that. Totes worth it, but job you know the job demands I move on. I'm not a server admin by by my day trade anymore. Just a nice little hobby you have sometimes. So in the back of my mind, right, I'm thinking I'm strategizing without really realizing I'm doing it. I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to get that vent toy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I sneak out there in the middle of the day. And I pop the Ventoy in the back because for whatever reason, the Super Micro, it doesn't have any USB ports in the front. And man, is that annoying. Like, come on. Region way in the yeah. back. So I'm doing this thing where I'm trying to get it way back in there. But of course, I have the NVMe in this big housing that has C and A on both ends of the connector for USB. So it's uh -huh. like, it's this big fat mother. And I'm trying to get it in there. And I, But it's only got two USB. Anyways, it was super really annoying. need to be looking at it and rotate the whole thing. But it, uh. I get the Ventoy attached. I reboot it. And I get this strange strange boot air like it's totally the obviously the ventoy is completely incompatible this is like three releases ago ventoy it's obviously totally incompatible with the super micro bios well, okay so i gotta go flash this ubuntu image directly to a usb thumb drive sure okay fine fine well i don't got time for that right now so i i was like okay well there goes my 15 minutes to try to solve this so i i move on and i keep i keep working to finish off my friday i uh, record a bitcoin dad pod and go, i go home because i got the kids Kids are over. We got it's stuff going on. Time. It's weekend time. Saturday, same thing. It's too hot. I can't really go down there and work on it Saturday. Take the kids out for a hike, which was also brutal. And then get home. It's like the evening. I think, oh, I could go down to the studio and get it going now. Because I want to make it ready for us to get it up right now and yeah. get it repaired. My thought is I could do the whole USB boot thing. I got the ISO image. I've got a USB thumb drive. I'm good to go. <sighs> Screw it. I'll come in Sunday morning. So I get in early this morning before the show while the server room is still nice and cool. And 
I'm looking at the other servers that are off, the other new servers that have been contributed by audience members. And I just thought while they're off, maybe I should just do a health check on these things too before these things end up dying on me. I open it up and it is covered in cottonwood. <laughs> oh, Chris. I open up the other server. <laughs> Covered in cottonwood. I pull out the drive trays, all of the air intakes, totally covered. So I, I kid you not, I spent an hour and 45 minutes this morning cleaning servers with cotton vacuuming. I pulling out every single disc, vacuuming them, putting them back in while because everything's down. So might as well do it now, right? Hey, I have a top tip for that. If you have a leaf yeah. blower or some compressed uh -huh. air, that's yeah. the best way because you don't need to touch things that way rather than vacuum. Well, and you know, the whole thing was all I had out there was a shop vac. I wasn't expecting this, right? But then I thought I should check this. Yeah. So then I think, well, I should probably go look how old fake Naz is doing, right? How's old fake Naz doing? And I go, and, and I didn't expect any of this. I didn't, I didn't even get the USB disc inserted before I started discovering something was a little strange. This is a pretty old box. And one of the things I just want to double check before I write this hard drive off completely is that the power is good and the data is good because the power is actually, I just noticed, coming off a little splitter here. So I'm going to get rid of this splitter and then uh, run it directly to the hard drive. Now, the hard drive itself is a Western Digital. It's one of those Velociraptor drives, so it's like 10,000 RPM. Honestly, I would actually expect this thing to die. Right, the other ones are all 7200, but this thing, not only was it not getting the proper cooling because the case was cracked, but it's also a 10,000 RPM disc. But we'll see, running, I'm running different power and I'm running slightly better spot here in terms of hopefully it would get better cooling. I doubt it. I'm actually just more kind of banking on the power situation. <laughs> that adapter looked a little sketch. I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. Okay. Here we go. It's actually a decent box. It has two L5640 Xeon CPUs in it at 2.27 gigahertz each. And I don't know, something like 48 gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of RAM, quite a bit of RAM. So, it, you know, it's lasted quite a way, long time for us. It's, it's definitely served its purpose, I should say. I could just use a couple of more months. Come on. Come on, keep going. Show me grub. Show me that grub. Show. <laughs> boop, baby, boop. No. Come on. Come on. It's booting. System D version 249.5-3-arch. dash Yes, this box is still running Arch. Um, I can't believe it. That is going to be the luckiest play ever because I had a ton of errors when I shut this thing down. So maybe that thing just got hot i don't know maybe that adapter got hot it's booting right now drives are flashing okay i got a snapshot failure here but that's not a big deal come on i can hear the hard drive clicking come on please boot i do not need this project right now uh-oh oh no there we go okay so one network interface didn't start but that's not even the primary network interface. We're up. We're up. I'm going to go check services. But the discs are flashing away. They look so happy. They look like a data Christmas tree. I don't remember why we did it, but when we hooked up that uh, extra OS boot drive, we added last minute. We hooked it up to a splitter, and I think that splitter was just done. It was dead. Now, obviously, clearly... This is like the third time we have pulled the server back from the absolute brink of death. And this time I really got a lesson learned. I, 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 I never want this to happen again. So uh, we'll get to that here in a second. But uh, what I was thinking, Wes, is what we ought to do is log into that thing and let's get it up to date. We better get it up to date. While, yeah. you know, while we can, while we're working on it, because I don't think it's been since we've done it on the show. And, you know, these arch boxes, they tend to break when you uh, go months without updating them. So why don't we do it now live on the show? If you wouldn't mind SSHing into there, uh, I checked earlier. I believe we have about a gigabyte worth of packages to download with a net upgrade size of 152 megabytes. 
It's essentially every system package, every app, every package on there. You love updates. So let's do it. Let's get it all up to date. Let's get this thing done and uh, make sure it's in a good spot for the rest of the road trip. And then I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. You're going to make me help you rip these Blu-rays if this doesn't work, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> we'll come back to that. We'll see how you do, Wes. You let us know, okay? Oh, net upgrade size, 150 megabytes. Yeah, isn't that uh, great? Just what a thing. It's, it is pretty great. I've realized we should colo these. Uh, these these probably shouldn't be in my garage anymore. It's been fun, and I've got away with it for years. But when the cottonwood came in, and it, <laughs> <laughs> it it made me realize that this is just not a this is not a doable thing anymore. And so, uh, if anyone out there in the audience in the Pacific Northwest area happens to work at a data center or a colo location where we could take two or three boxes and put them in a rack where they could be properly taken care of. Please reach out, Chris at jupiterbroadcasting.com or linuxunplugged.com slash contact. We'd be willing to work out a deal. I need to get him out of this garage. It's just time. You know, like I thought we'd get air conditioning, but we didn't. And I figured we'd f that shutting them down would be enough. But it clearly wasn't because there was just some time when just things happened. And when I went out there and I touched that box that, that Thursday night, that evening, it was so hot I could barely keep my hands on it. That's, you know, it's like, how can this system last, right? It just, it possibly could make it a little bit longer, but eventually this box is going to die and those boxes that have been given to us by the audience are going to die. And it's not like they're, you know, especially that box, it's not in, in the show path. We don't need it to to do our recording, so. Yeah, we just got to get it, we got to get it hosted and co -load. It was. It's been a fun experiment, but if anybody out there has... Any uh, any ideas or can hook us up? Let us know. Because I think, what are you laughing about? You oh, I just funny? like the idea of you know you sort of taking care of these things, trundling out to the out to the garage, you know, checking on them, yeah, touch, I do. touching them, logging in the old fashioned way with the little the yep. ancient LED LCD My monitor. My first LCD screen I bought ever a hundred years ago. Four three ratio, right? Yep, of course. I think it's a fourteen inch screen, which it's a KDS, which I don't even think that brand is around anymore. I think they died long. Long time ago. Hey, and just think now you get credentials to go into a data center that could potentially lock you out if there's a a BGP error. How, how much fun would that be? <laughs> I know. This is where I'm not really a big fan of this idea is the, the whole idea with these is it's like large data stuff that you'd really only want to transfer over a gigabit land anyways, like source files or media files or things that we want to do. Like we want to take 15 MP3 files convert them, or FLAC files, convert them to MP3 and upload them to our radio stream. Like, you don't want to do that necessarily on a cloud box, but... Maybe we just got to accept we don't have servers in the summer. It's just a wintertime thing that we do. Yeah, maybe. You know, one thing that's been really handy is I've broken the tasks up a little bit. So, Jupes yeah. has its own network. So, I like, my immediate media files and whatnot, and my home assistant, I'll run on a local network on a Raspberry Pi. And then here I have a home assistant blue that runs the home assistant... Mm. automations for the studio right and then we have one of the dell systems that we've set up that's running a lot of the automated tasks that's good to go in another system that's running a lot of the data storage and that's been fine and those don't even need to be on 24 7 so i can just leave them off for days at a time but fake nas was like i needed to turn it on like once a day you know it's not always great to turn a server on and off all the time either you know they tend to just like to stay on at a good even temperature i feel bad it's like they're my garden you know and I'm not being Growing very some, good. some weird fruit. Yeah, I got weeds in my garden. I'm not watering them properly, you know. That's what's uh, going Chris, on. you were going to touch on lessons learned. I, I, I feel like we can make quite a list out of that story. Do you think that's a nice idea? <laughs> yeah, my lesson is colo. That's my lesson. <laughs> that's that's colo, the overall lesson. But I feel like try not to get cottonwood in your yeah. servers. <laughs> right. That's a good lesson, right? Rule number yeah. one. Maybe the wind tunnel wasn't the best idea. Get some filters for your wind tunnel. Mm. Yeah. And then um, pull the trigger on setting up that whole temperature sensor thing with the smart plugs that you were going to do last year. Like a year ago. Yeah. Um, it would also be good, like, maybe we shouldn't have put everything into production until we had the cooling and the rack solution done, because I thought we would get that that's, done. That's my fault. I'm going to take that one. Alex, do you have any uh, advice? Nothing that hasn't already been said. I mean, it's, it's all... It's all obvious, isn't it? Back up your configs, kids. This is uh, this is Uncle Chris telling you right now. 
I just had a brush with death. And my first thought was, I don't know if I backed up the config. <laughs> Linode.com slash unplugged. Go there to get $100 and 60-day credit on a new account. And it's just a great way to support the show and check something great out. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting with the best support in the business. Underscore that. Real humans all the time. Take out your highlighter, even though sometimes it makes the ink blur a little bit. Highlight this. The best support in the business. Man, does that matter when it really matters. You know, thinking about it, I've been getting notes from audience members who were maybe on a different cloud provider who's been changing things recently, and they're just not very happy anymore, and they're looking to migrate. I've also heard from some of you out there who have looked for, like, the ultimate budget provider because you just got a cheap machine you're throwing together, and the next thing you know, it's been running for three months, it's kind of important to you, and uh, now you want it somewhere better. Well, that credit works for you, too. Go to linode.com slash unplugged and just try it out for a bit. It could also be a great way to try out something like a multi-cloud strategy. This summer, our garage slash server room, in air quotes, to the extreme, it's getting up to like 90 degrees, 92 degrees, 93 degrees some days, uh, especially if I park the hot car in there. And the reality is, it's been a peace of mind knowing on the, during the summer, I just moved some of this stuff over to Linode, and I don't, I don't really need it here in the garage. Sure, I'd like to have access on my LAN, but the reality is, Linode's infrastructure is so fast that it's typically faster than my own gear anyways, like even locally. It's crazy because they are their own ISP, and they have 11 data centers around the world. So for this kind of stuff, I'll just pick the one on the, on the West Coast, right? You pick the one closest to you. And then they have MVME disks in there. They have AMD Epic processors for the dedicated GPU machines. In fact, if you want physical hardware, too, they can work with you on that. Linode's constantly adding new features like databases as a service. So that way, if you just want Linode to run your Postgres or MySQL or your Mongo, they'll do it for you. They'll bring their expertise that they've collected for the last 19 years, and they'll bring it to something like a hosted database service. Nobody else has this combination of features. And this is the place you go to support the show, too. It's a win-win. So go check it out. I think you're really going to like it. If you've been considering it, maybe migrating from one of those other providers, maybe you're just done with the hyperscalers crap, go try out Linode. You know what's up. Linode.com slash unplugged. One more time, just go to Linode.com slash unplugged. We have some small website up updates on the new website. Uh, we have something like... I think it's something like 60 people now in our matrix chat room that are keeping updated on the new website, which is pretty amazing. And I was able to recently convince Alex to jump into the project. And uh, I think that was a good thing. Alex, Hello. What have you been up to this week? What haven't I been up to? Uh, we've been doing a lot of infrastructure work, a lot of basic plumbing and stuff like that, that actually just needs the JB crew, I suppose, to, to do it really. Cause you know, we, you know, there, there are servers at the end of the day. We're using GitHub Actions to fully automate the deployment of the building of the Hugo site and then deploying that to a Linode node. <laughs> I never know what to call them. I always used to node. call them droplets back in the day, but, you know, Linode nodes. We changed the URL of the website. And you did some fancy DNS stuff, didn't you? Ah, yes. This this was a long time ago, actually. Uh, the orange one, and I wrote some pretty ninja level which probably means hacky as f ansible code which automatically scans the docker compose file for the relevant traffic labels and then automatically updates the cloudflare dns records using ansible under the hood so you could for example spin up a new container have the correct traffic label against that container and not need to open cloudflare and type it all in and all that kind of stuff now you could argue you could do that using Terraform, but the advantage of doing it this way with Ansible is it's just one command, it's all in one place, and it's all automated. That's awesome. And we do have a new URL that we want everybody to uh, use. And also, please, we need some people to test the new website. So, Alex, what did you make the new URL? We thought long and hard, deep into the night about how to name this thing. New.jupiterbroadcasting.com So that's where the new website is being sort of tested for now. Um, if you just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, it's currently the old WordPress website that's still functional and still up to date and everything. But the new uh, website that we're building is at new.jupiterbroadcasting.com. And uh, if you want to get more involved, please join our matrix room and also check out our GitHub. 
don't forget, also coming up in this week's office hours, we're going to do a deep dive into a lot more of the configuration and the plans for, you know, continuous integration and feature branches and all that kind of stuff. I'm looking forward to that. A lot of good stuff. Yeah, so if you're coming in and you're going, new website, what are you guys talking about? Yeah, we've been covering this in officehours.hair. This is a new community project that's just absolutely incredible. And it's coming along. Brent says small updates, huge updates. Huge. It's a whole brand new website, statically generated on demand when we publish a new episode. And it's coming together. And we're kind of in the final stretch. And we'd love your feedback. So we do have our GitHub page where you can uh, give us some feedback. But just go check it out at new.jupiterbroadcasting. Chris, you got a nice new feature as well this week, didn't you? This is so cool. So, oh man, this is a great time to be building this website because we're we're kind of embracing new ideas and new ways of doing stuff. And one of them is PeerTube. Yeah. We're back on the PeerTube bandwagon, baby, at jupiter.tube. And we want to start using that for our live stream in bed because, you know, just today, as we were getting ready to start the show, we started playing a song and we realized, oh no, this might actually get us kicked off of YouTube just playing this. And so as we move forward, it's like, why do we want to keep promoting Google's platform or Amazon's platform with Twitch, like why not promote our own free software platform that's not going to take us down? And so then the next question was, well, shouldn't we be using that as our embed? But how are we going to do that? Are we going to like do a new embed for PeerTube every single time we want to do a live stream? How's that going to work? And we've been kicking that around. And this is a great example of our community came in with a solution that is so slick, so elegant. And they're using a lot of like native technologies that we're just now implementing, like PeerTube. And they're looking at the PeerTube API and they're saying, how can we use this to properly embed a live stream on the new website? And the guys dug through it and they found a way where when we go live on PeerTube, it can automatically update the website. And I don't know if it's changing the embed at the website or if the embed is just somehow auto updating, but it is so, I don't do anything but go live. And the website automatically gets the new embedded live stream from PeerTube. Just how it should be. It's so Magic. cool. It's so cool. Like we're building and we're, we're building a, a page that talks about how to do boost. So that way we have all that explained in, in one place. And in the future, I imagine you'll actually be able to boost from there. We've got a page for the memberships. We've got a page for all of the hosts, our swag store, the calendar. And of course, the new player is so slick. It supports chapters. It supports a lot of the new podcasting 2.0 spec. It's an open source player itself, Podverse. I'll talk about that more in the show. It's all coming together in, in one statically generated website that's going to just load beautifully and fast for everybody, hopefully. And the neat thing is, like, you know, you mentioned the player. Well, the Podverse player, Mitch over there, um, was happy to collaborate with us. And we went back and forth for, I don't know, something like two weeks sending some requests for certain features and they built it in and then they'd send a request from us to do something a little differently. It's been really cool to interact with other open source projects as well in our efforts. So I think everyone over at the website creation team, I think big applause and, and thank you for making this so much fun. Yeah. I think that actually is worth just talking about a little bit more is yeah. we didn't intend for this to happen, but there's been some other projects that have gotten bug fixes and they've made some improvements and changes as we've been building this website. It really has been a collaborative open source project, which, which is just really awesome. We didn't necessarily intend for that to happen, but... Freaking open source. Yep. And all of this that we're doing, it's all up on our GitHub. It's all there. While we're talking about Podverse, I, I might as well mention that the Android and iOS clients are getting Boost support. It's in F-Droid right now. As we record, I believe this morning it's landing in the Play Store and it is currently in review on the Apple iOS Store. But uh, version 4.60 has uh, boosting in the mobile client as well. So Podverse is one of these podcasting 2.0 clients we like a lot because they have an iOS, Android, and web player. It's all GPL. It's available in F-Droid if you'd like it. And uh, it's embeddable, too, as a player. So you, as a listener, could create a Podverse FM account with the online player and then when you go to our website, you could play it in there. And you could click a little button and bring it into your overall Podverse list of uh, podcasts. It's it's going to be very slick. So do check out Podverse. They are iterating quickly, and it'll be landing in Play and the App Store this week. And it's already an F-Droid, a brand new version with lots of fancy features. And uh, they're just it's, they're just a great team. Like Brent said, we we worked with them on the website. It's been awesome. So Podverse.fm for that. 
I think Brent's found a new calling. I don't know if he realizes it quite yet, but a new calling as being a scrum master or some kind of a project manager because <laughs> he wakes up and I know the first thing he does is he looks at his phone and checks just how many pull requests have been opened that night and how many issues. But the other thing I think that we need to just underscore is how Brent's really driven this community engagement. I know that you're my friend and everything, but I think you've done a great job with it. Well done. Well, thank you. It really has. Round of applause. And we're just, and really, not to early celebrate, but we're really close to the finish line, right? Like we're so close. And I don't think we'd be there if it wasn't for Brent's work. So Absolutely. Of course, Stefan, and, and really there is an entire team of people. If you go to GitHub. There's a huge team. Go to yeah. GitHub. Look at the Jupiter Broadcasting Com insights and look at the last 30 days. It's going to blow your mind. It's It's so awesome. Isn't it? It's incredible. It's really amazing. Yeah, I think uh, it it outpaced what we were expecting, and I think that's really exciting. I, you know, in like fourteen, fifteen years, I think it's the most successful community project JB's ever done. So, and a big part of that is thanks to Brent. Big part of that's thanks to Stefan, and really just the incredible community we've built and the philosophy of value for value because it's not always just sats and dollars; it's time and talent as well. Absolutely. Bitwarden.com slash Linux. Go there to get started with a free trial for an individual or a business. It's Bitwarden.com slash Linux. It's just the easiest way for you or a team of people to manage secrets and passphrases, things that really are important. And Bitwarden is open source, so you know that their security is audible, it's open, it's transparent, and it's trusted by millions of individuals and teams in their community. It's what we use to manage our passwords, our two-factor codes, and other sensitive recovery keys for the applications that require that. And then it's also how I manage to have complex, secure passwords on my mobile device because I also have Bitward installed on my mobile devices. I put it in my browser. I grab the app from Flathub because they've got a flat pack of Bitwarden, which is great for getting a new system set up. And I put it on my mobile devices. And I always appreciate the little changes that come down the pipe from Bitwarden, the little improvements, the tweaks, the iteration on the UI, the things that just make the workflow smoother, like account switching and and recently, I mean, like just last week, they got support for cross-domain identity management right there in Bitwarden. So like for enterprises, it makes it so much easier now to provision Bitwarden for your users. They also recently added a username generator. So that way you can have a unique username and a unique password for every website and service that you sign up for. But not just username and password. They also have an option to create an email alias for each service or website that you sign up for. You know, it just routes it through simple logon or Firefox relay. And then the service doesn't doesn't know really anything about you. And if they get a breach, which a service I use just had a breach last week, then it doesn't share your identifying information, something that you might use on another site or service, right? It's just that site and services information. So it's limited in its damage it's going to do. Just small things like that using a password manager, using a unique password, using a unique username, and even a unique email address for every website and service you use is going to greatly enhance your online privacy and security. It might just be the number one thing you can do. And Bitwarden is the tool that makes this actually doable and manageable. So go try it out for yourself or your business. Go try it for free at bitwarden.com slash Linux. It's also a great way to support the show. And maybe you already know all this, but maybe somebody you know, maybe a teammate at work needs to hear this, maybe a friendish. I mean, if they're a friend, you've already had them switch to Bitwarden. But I'm not going to make judgments. Maybe a family member you don't talk to very often. We'll frame it that way. Maybe they need to know about Bitwarden. Send them over to bitwarden.com slash Linux. One more time to support the show, it's bitwarden.com slash Linux. Now, you know we have some meetups to talk about here. Let's get... A little bit of meetup going here. We have not one, not two, but maybe like four or five coming up. September 20th, Southern Oregon. September 23rd, Northern California. September 29th, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. <laughs> September 30th, Southern California. October 7th, Northern Oregon. All of them. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. If you're in the area, let's meet up. We're going to also have some swag on board. But we'll also, even if you can't make it to the meetup, have something for you. Brand new idea. We're going to stash little geocaches along the way. Oh. And then we'll give you hints in the show where you can find them. 
So even if you can't make it to the meetup, maybe you can still get some swag. We're leaving something behind for you. I got to pick up like some Tupperware containers, I'm thinking. Don't give it all away. No, I'll put them in it. I'm going to put some swag, some, you know, like shirt stickers, some stuff in there. Can we do like and then perishable we'll... food items? That's probably a yeah. single oh. hair in each. Probably shouldn't do like a banana. Probably shouldn't. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Although, how impressive. That'll tell you how long it's been in Right. There. Like if, if somebody. Syrup? What if somebody found it and then took a picture with like a like a still edible banana? That'd be very impressive, right? Right. Maybe we should put a banana in there. I think there's an <laughs> argument for a banana. <laughs> Now get finding, y'all. Yeah. So we'll <laughs> let you know. As we hit the road, we'll hide them along the way and uh, give you hints here in the show. But come say hi to us. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. You know what it is. I think it's time for some feedback. Yeah. Up first is uh, actually a listener who found their way here after you were a guest over on the Podcasting 2.0 show. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, Arno writes in, and has got some questions about the Raspberry Pi. Maybe you can help us out here, Chris. All right. Do you know of any solution for using the Pi on battery power? Now, specifically with the Smart Pi Touch 2, which I guess is like a fancy case that includes a screen. Unfortunately, Pi juice does not work. I guess the developer says that the Pi and the screen draws too much power. Hm. Using a power bank with extra cable isn't very portable. Oh, well, okay. I was going to say that's really how you do it, right? Because then you can size it to how you needs it. But of course, I'm thinking not so portable. How would you do that portably? The only thing I could really think of is like something like the Moto Dock. But I don't know if that's going to be really easy to get your hands on these days. I think you got to build yourself essentially a Tupperware container. <laughs> <laughs> With a banana. <laughs> And then you, you, you put all that in the Tupperware container, and then you just make the Tupperware container portable. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, swing and a miss, maybe, but... Maybe here's, maybe somebody listening has a better idea. Here's a second chance over here. Okay, all right, all right. Do you have any advice for, like, a good microphone or audio setup to use with the Pi? I think Arno's tried a USB stick with PCM 2902 and a 3.5 millimeter jack. Oh, no, Playback no, no, no. was fine, but input does not seem to work. Now, I don't know how you're doing your storage. So this is going to be the problem, but you absolutely got to go USB audio interface. I think something like the uh, Audio-Technica ATR could possibly do in this scenario. I don't know if the Blue Icicle is still easily available too, but that'll take any XLR mic and make it into a USB mic with just one di device. It's kind of a big device, bigger than the Raspberry Pi, <laughs> but it's a thing. That's probably how I would do it, Wes. The other thing, although we had limited success with it, is you could look at that Raspberry Pi Ninja project. Maybe they'd have more success than we did. If so, write back in and let us know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, another feedback item today from Paul, responding to Linux Unplugged 468, the read-only scenario. Before listening, if you had asked me what distros I'd recommend to a new or long-term Linux user, I would not have even thought about suggesting Endless. But after... Love 468, I think I have to say it's an awesome and no-nonsense distro. Years ago, I heard about Endless and the Endless computer, and I thought it'd be a great idea for my children, you know, encourage them to start learn, coding, that kind of thing. Anyway, long story short, the laptop was not really used much by my children, but since my Mac was aging, already no longer receiving updates, I started using the Endless computer. <laughs> While my use case is really just web browsing, email, word processing, and the occasional spreadsheet, it performs perfectly, especially as this is a pretty low-cost machine. And the time we've had this laptop, have never had any issue with updates or day-to-day -day use, and we've never had to open the command line to fix or rectify anything. Now, this could be attributed to our basic use case, the well-thought-out operating system, or a combination of both. I propose we do have a bit of an endless blind spot. I think that it is true. I think we don't think about Endless very much because I think they haven't targeted our user base very much. Yeah. But then as we start talking about these immutable systems that we want to just work out of the box for workstations, I start thinking maybe we should have been looking at Endless more. So that's great feedback. Uh, thank you for that. I, I will uh, put that into like my, you know, the back of my mind. I feel like we've we've done the immutable thing quite a bit. Do we need to do another one? But Endless is kind of its own thing. When was the last time we really gave it a go? We've never. I don't think we've ever looked at Endless. Infinity, got it. Really? <sighs> you know, the Endless computer kind of piques my interest from what we've been talking about lately with these low-end computers as well. So it's almost like a two-episode hit here. 
I was going to say we could send Brent off for a field report. I, I'm not sure I follow the logic. It's not like we wouldn't cover Arch if we just covered Ubuntu, though, is it? So not covering it because we already just covered Nix. Like, they're, they're different things. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. You're right. I feel like, too, where, where it fits is I think it could be a solid competitor to Pop or Elementary or Mint. I think if you're one of those users, endless... One of those users? What are you saying? One of those... <laughs> Pop users. <laughs> Wait, don't don't we sometimes? Run? I just like a lot of punctuation in my Linux distribution. <laughs> I think, okay, I think, man. Don't I think sometimes. Me. Wait a minute. That's us. Sometimes. Wait. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. All right. You guys are probably right. I imagine. I mean, we should probably look at it. I don't know. Okay. You know, I don't mind trying it. I think I've had Fedora on this laptop for a little bit. It's been a mixed bag. That maybe we'll talk about. I don't mind jumping on unless giving that a shot. He says so casually over there. These little nuggets. I would like a long. I would like a long term review, and then okay, maybe we should do this next week. Now, the more we talk about it, the more I'm kind of wanting to do it. All right. Okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll put it up to for discussion in the committee after the show. And now it is time for the boost. Un five oh one wrote in with three thousand sats. I have two B-Link Mini S systems and an Asus PN41 that I'll be using to learn uh, Kubernetes on, an actual tiny cluster of systems. They're all running NixOS with GNOME wonderfully with a combined TDP. What's TDP? I'm out of the loop here. Oh, total, total, Alex, total power, I think. Power draw? Domestic. Draw of power. Total draw of power. <laughs> That's my best guess. Of only 36 watts, which was definitely a major consideration when my electric supply cost more than doubled this year. All three ran Windows 11 fine for all of the five minutes each it took to get the Windows license registered with the account. Not that I'm ever likely to use those licenses. Not related to the question, but TDP is thermal design power. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> Definitely. You're close. Definitely close. Definitely. Definitely close. Yeah. Wooden 501 also sent in an off-air boost. Now, Chris, what's an off-air boost? So one of the things we've decided to do is I think we're I think I can't remember, honestly, because we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. <laughs> Don't reveal our secrets, man. I think it's a two thousand sat limit to get on air. It might have been a thousand. I can't remember. I think you said a thousand last episode, All right, but, but then I could I, be misremembering. You should have just said a row of dice. So here's here's the thing, Chris, you said a thousand in Lup and then it said two thousand in self posted. Yeah. I think and, that's why you're confused. Uh, and coder, right? Because I'm trying to real because I'm just I, I we want to keep it tight, but we we also will read every single boost that's sent in. And every now and then we'll pull one forward. And so Wooden had a thousand boost here. And I thought, you know, we should read this one because he says that e-ink display tablet you got could be a good boost board. And I agree. Brent's got a note. You know, you, Ooh, you just, that's a good idea. You'd basically need to get like Firefox or something working. That's all you'd really need to display it. So it seems a little heavy on that, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Everything's possible. I think going forward to keep the segment tight, we're going to set the minimum at 2000 boost for an on air read. But uh, 2,000 sats, but uh, we'll read 100% all of them sent into the show. And maybe every now and then pull one or two of them ahead. Rasta Calavera, a.k.a. Rusta Castaversa. Give that man a banana. Wrote in with a row of ducks. Thank you kindly. Apparently Chris really butchered his name last week, so apologies there. Yeah. Apologies. I like Rusta Castaversa. I think that's a great name. So, so Rusta Casta Calavera uh, wrote in uh, suggesting, <laughs> should I try that again? Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> okay, spell it now. <laughs> I am now Rusta Castaversa and expect the Rust audio clip when I boost. They write... Brent, you should start a Calibre web instance and send cool things to that e-ink display. Or use it as a GPS navigator when you drive. That's not a bad idea. I'm thinking a Mario-like map that shows you moving around the country. Meetups <laughs> are all the bonus levels. Hey, that's a fun idea. What's the castle is my real question. Hmm, the studio and your place and Alex's place, like, you know, major landmarks could be castles, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't you think? Should we do the, I think maybe we'll do the live tracker again for this road trip. If we can get all our ducks in a row, mm -hmm. I think uh, we should do the live tracker again because that the nice thing about that is it did lead to a few micro meetups. One, two, three, four That's people. Very true. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. It's fun following you along. Yeah. So it just is. We might set up the tracker again. We only got a few creeps. It was fun. Yeah, it was totally good. 
All right, next boost comes in from DFJ225 with 16,000 sats. Because I'm a back home baller in pajamas that cost $10. Hey folks, I've been itching to use Rust for a project and I've got a few Raspberry Pis laying around wondering if you've got any recommendations for a useful or fun project idea. Thanks. And uh, Wes, you just tossed a link here in the notes. Yeah, I mean, it can be a little tricky. A, because you can do so much on the Raspberry Pi and then B, of course, you know, you can do a lot of things with Rust. So it kind of depends on what areas you're interested in. But it looks like there's a... Raspberry Pi operating system, like writing an embedded OS in Rust, targeting the Pi. And uh, I mean, I might have to try that because that sounds fun. Interesting. Well, that's pretty great. I I was just going to suggest put Linux on there and get the Rust tools installed and just play around with some different projects. And it's fun just to be on an ARM system and all. Yeah. I mean, there is a little bit of like getting used to that as well. All right. 412 Linux boosts in with 2048 sats, which I think is actually a gigabyte boost. Is this live audio from the server room? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the cottonwoods bag. (laughs) Oh, no. It's it's almost that old. It is almost that old. He says, I agree that the boosts do provide an easy way to get feedback into the show. I've been listening to the podcast. I've been listening to your podcast since 2005, and many things have gotten easier regarding podcasts. It used to take effort to get podcasts onto mobile devices. I mean, remember having to use Juice? Now it just happens automatically on our pocket computers. Boosts are the next evolution for easy feedback. Straight up from the app, I, li- I listen right there, and I can send it from my pocket computer while I listen. Great content as usual. Thanks, everyone. Great job. Well, thank you very much, 412. That's incredible. I mean, you're a podcast OG, so uh, I, I respect your opinion on that. Uh, Nev writes in, uh, before really I was firm on the 1,000 or 2,000 sat thing, so he's making it under the wire. So you mean before like five minutes ago? <laughs> yeah, like five minutes ago. <laughs> gotcha, yeah. yep. Uh, also, and Nev's like such a long timer that I feel like, you know. Coming in hot with the boost. <laughs> Nev boosts in with a hot 1877. 1877 sats is the year Ernst Warner von Siemens invented the first ever moving coil microphone. Oh, how about that? That's great to know, Nev. Also, PSA, Ohio Linux Fest will be uh, soon, coming up soon at the Hamilton Hotel in Columbus, Ohio, December 2nd to the 3rd. That's not that soon. (laughs) (laughs) But it is a good amount of notice to get your plans in order. Get your plans in order. With the price of tickets, it's a good idea. Of course, uh, Nev's going to be there. Would love to hear if the community wants to put a meetup together. I know a couple of decent spots in Columbus. Nice. All right, we got to figure this out. Maybe we should create a Columbus Matrix room. So uh, let's make a note. We'll make a Columbus Matrix room, and we'll link to it in the uh, show notes. It'll also be listed in the overall space. we got to remember to do this. Christmas in Columbus. Yeah, Christmas in Columbus. Uh, I don't know if we'll be there, but I really don't feel like that should be a reason these meetups shouldn't happen. We're starting to see these self-organize, and why the hell not? Because the audience is full of awesome people. Think about it. Think about what the chances are. If somebody else is also a listener to this show, it's likely you're going to get along. Such great taste. It's crazy how well it works. All right. Marcel boosts in with some dirty 30 sats. 30-30. Yeah. That's the Kool-Aid man, by the way, if you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, Because if you are uh, in your 30s, you know who the Kool-Aid man is. Is this the original Kool-Aid man or is this the family guy pastiche of (laughs) Kool-Aid man? (laughs) Uh, To stay true to the medium, I looked up how many years ago was 30 years ago. Which is like the early 90s, of course, obviously. I think you'll find it was exactly 30 years ago. Yeah, it turns out. <laughs> and I went and found commercials on YouTube from that time. And then I grabbed the Kool-Aid man from the summer commercials of that era. And that's why this show is technically historical fiction. That's right. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just putting it out there. Like, if you wanted to help with the boost sound clips, you want to get some variety into the show, this is my process. You know, I was like, okay. 30 years ago. All right, let's go to what it was on TV. And I just went and got something. And we'll never talk about it again. And you'll only know if you've listened to this episode what that's a reference to. And that's just how it works. There we go. <laughs> All right, moving on. This is a crazy episode. Marcel writes, uh, for the member bat line, we were talking in the post show about how to create a, a system for the members of Unplugged Core to get a hold of us. If you want to build it into the app, the only thing you can really do these days is boosting the member feed. You'd need to set up a wallet and... You'd need to have, like, maybe some expectations on your end of lower amounts. Uh, but I know some people don't like the boost or they don't want to get into it. So maybe a secret web form could work. It's a bit high friction. Maybe a secret matrix channel. 
Yeah, we're thinking about a bat line for the members. Matrix Channel came in a couple of times as a suggestion. I, don't, I wonder how feasible that is. Would it stay secret? Would it? Huh. I don't know. But we're going to figure something out. Yeah, there's a lot of good options. Uh, let us know if you have any thoughts. Next up in the boost department, from the PMO fam, will a row of ducks. This old duck still got it. Giving Fountain a try on Android. Sending a row of ducks for Brent's gas tank. Aw. Aw, thank thanks. you. Thanks, fam. Ooh, thanks. It runs on fuel, but ducks will work, too. <laughs> oh, and, you know, the PMO fan did not stop there. Another row of ducks. Oh, double boost. And, you know... I guess tossing in the talent of agreement here, the package manager debate is annoying as hell. Oi to all the vays. Can I just say, this week alone, there was at least two different threads on our Linux about package managers. Again, can we just, like, here, here's, here's a wild proposal. Could we just get some sort of group consensus to stop talking about it and just let the market decide? And whichever end users end up using, we just go with? And we stop debating it endlessly? Yeah, but what if it snaps? <laughs> yeah, that's true. What if it is snaps? But Chris, which that, one is be, That's a good point, Wes. I can't, <laughs> I can't argue with that. <laughs> Space Ninja wrote in as well with 15,703 sats. Oh! Because I'm a back home baller. If I want something, I just holler. I've been running Mint on an HP ProBook from 2011 that has a dual-core i5 and 8 gigs of RAM since about Mint 18. I love it as a mobile just hop in and write some code device. It's been really stable, and I just upgrade only every couple of years. Oh, that sounds dangerous. But apparently works fine. I don't know. If it works, how nice would that be? Sounds hassle-free to me. You know? They continue, uh, my custom main rig has had just about every distro on it, but I recently circled back to Mint because I'm done fiddling because of lack of time. So it's VM only for testing and Mint 7365 every day of the year. I've only loved watching this little distro since about version 15. Hey, that's way better than going back to the Mac or Windows. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it works for you. And in fact, I really appreciate that. It does give us good perspective. That's a really good use case to keep in mind. Well, and I feel like maybe Mint hasn't really changed that much, much since back then. I, I, I used to use it, I think it was around 17... 17 is when I first got in, right up to 19. And uh, the way that it doesn't like totally change the paradigm is also, I think, maybe an advantage. Yeah, it's a feature. Sure, for certain workloads, yeah. M. Vaughn also wrote in with 2,000 sats. Thanks for the weekly episodes. Plenty of material to get me through 30 hours of driving out to the East Coast. 30 hours. 30 hours. Uh, you know, when you say something like that, that's such a tease. M. V., you got to... You got to boost it and tell us, like, where are you driving? Give us more. Because the commuter is the original podcaster's friend, and there's less and less, and now we're hearing about new ways people are finding to listen to podcasts. I'm always curious, like, if you were a commuter and you transitioned to, like, listening to the show during a different routine, what was it, and how did it go? And are you able to stay current? I guess I'll find out. Boost in and let us know. But also, uh, MV, uh, what are you doing? What are you driving? 30 hours of driving? Is that per day? Are you driving more than there are hours in the day? Are you a time traveler? You got to give us more details, man. Is that there and back or just one way? Well, it's clearly just got to be, it's one way, right? I mean, it's got to be. There's no details, I assume. I assume. Robin Webb 74 also wrote in with 3,000 cents. Coming in hot with the boost. <laughs> Hello from Slovenia. How, how many listeners do we have from my country? I like your shows. Thank you. I'll be first to say Slovenia isn't like the top of our list. But a lovely place I'd love to visit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, an interesting factoid about Slovenia is that they have a reciprocal arrangement with Slovakia that they actually return each other's posts with the wrong <laughs> address on it because they get confused so often. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, I did look up the numbers before the show. We have just over 10,000 listeners as of this morning in that area. That is impressive. Which is just beating out the Republic of Lithuania, where we have 9.2 thousand listeners. Uh, and just above Slovenia is Croatia with 10.6 thousand listeners. Well, we love all of you. And it's not a contest, nope. don't worry, but it might kind of be a contest. Yeah, it might be. It might be. But that's the, isn't that neat, though? That's amazing. Yeah. And of course, uh, in that same region is Turkey and Saudi Arabia, kind of in those same numbers, a little bit more, about 12,000 in Turkey. 
I was blown away when I saw that. Absolutely blown away. And a little a little humble reminder that this is your world's largest Linux podcast. And uh, the numbers show it. And those are to the hundreds. I mean, like right down. I'm telling you, Republic of Lithuania, I can tell you 9,217, right? Like, it's beautiful. This old duck still got it. Lower third writes in, longtime listener, first time booster. It's a real Mario and Luigi situation when it comes to Linux hardware on the cheap, but it's good to know that Mate, Mint, and XFC have us covered. Great show. Or is it more of a Wario and Waluigi type situation? Oh, I don't know. Wes. Uh, I love it when we get a longtime listener, first time booster. Uh, that's growing the Lightning Network. And the Lightning Network is a peer to peer free software network. And we are seeing more and more free software projects come on. And that means, imagine the day when your favorite free software project, maybe it's VLC, maybe it's Nano, if you're a gentleman, you know, your, fr your favorite free software project comes online to the Lightning Network, and you've got a wallet full of Satoshis because you've been listening to our podcast. That's how you start to monetize free software, is we're building a network right now. It's going to make a difference. And so when we get Chiron, aka Lower Third, coming on for the first time after listening, we're building to that network. And there are now over 7,000, almost 8,000 podcasts on the Lightning Network. So that is pretty gosh darn exciting. Mr. Quackers comes in. <laughs> okay. Mr. Quackers comes in with 2,222 cents. Another road, ducks. Quacker waka, it's a treasure. Yippee. Uh, they say the Asus Vivo Book L203MA, 175 bones on Amazon. It's small, not very powerful, but Fedora and KDE works just fine on there. It's not necessarily compatible with a FWAP manager, you know, you know, for your LVFS. Your old FWAP D. But you still can update the BIOS from the USB old school style. Uh, I use it if I'm going somewhere and I don't really care if it gets lost or stolen. It's just not a big deal. Uh, I haven't used it in a while, but you know what? The battery, when I did use it, lasted eight to 10 hours. I also have an X1 Carbon Fedora edition. I think the recent BIOS update, or maybe it was a kernel version, increased my battery life to an extra hour. Have you experienced that? So my X1 Carbon has gotten better with time on Fedora as, as well, Quackers. And, and Nix as well. It is better now. It's still not the battery life where I'd like it to be, but I swear it is better than where it was when I first got it, which when does that happen? And, you know, Wes and I follow the uh, kernel updates pretty, pretty closely for the uh, Linux Action News over there. And we have definitely seen a stream of Intel driver updates and improvements for power management from both AMD and Intel in the last year. So I, I think it's absolutely the case that when you get a newer kernel, when people say, why do you want a new kernel in your Linux? Well, because it's usually faster and it has more hardware support and improvements. That's why, obviously. But yeah, I think a kernel update does improve your battery life because I've seen it happen. Uh, Quackers came in with a dubs boost with a row of ducks. Things are looking up for all but duck. Uh, just to clarify, I did mean the Asus VivoBook L203MA Ultra Thin Edition. It does look pretty nice. You know, it's got one of those 180 degree, like fold flat screen kind of things. Oh. Pretty light. It's got USB C. Really not bad for like 175. A hundred? What? Oh, 184 at the time. I'm okay. looking at this. All at right. Least, Even too. still. But, you know, you could get it by Friday. I mean, that's not bad, right? That's not bad. A machine by Friday during these days, not so bad. Uh, Source D just comes in. With nothing but a row of ducks. That's mighty hospitable of you. Thank you for the ducks. We also got some thank you boosts that I wanted to cover on the show. I'll just do a selection of these under the 2000 mark. Uh, 1701 sats from True Grits. Also doubling down on the idea of an unplugged core members matrix exclusive chat room. I don't know how the heck we do it. Maybe just a private URL. But all right. We got a few, uh, we got a few plus ones for that. Uh, Mega Strike 3 sent in 2000 sats. Just gas money for Brent. Thank you. Thank you. And we got a thousand sats from iBookie with a question that I wanted to cover. So what happens if I send a boost in and I think you guys missed it? What should you do? So the, the easiest resolution is if you're, when you boost in, if your username matches your matrix username, a lot of times I'll just coordinate with you on matrix. Like we'll get boosts in under 2000 sats and I will follow up with them on matrix. Like the golden dragon boosted in just under uh, 2000 sats. And so we were talking about a new uh, board that he has that I think would be good for home assistant because he uses the same username in the boosts that he uses on the matrix, right? So I can track him down that way. 
But otherwise, just if you're not on Matrix, you can always send me an email, chris at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Just give me, a, you know, like a screenshot or like a copy of it, and we'll get it all sorted out. I try to read 100% of them, but I am but one man. However, Wes Payne has concocted a few ideas on how we'll be able to actually just import those messages into our various channels as appropriate down the road in the future, which is going to be really cool. Because it's all, turns out, I'm not even kidding, all of these boosts live in a database that has a Rust front end with an API. Well, you just don't want, you won't even install non-Rust software anymore. I keep trying to get you to consider some fun picks, but you just won't. That Dave Jones, he did it right. So, uh, yeah, we'll have that coming soon. If you'd like to send a boost into the show, go grab a new podcast app at newpodcastapps.com. You can also check out Podverse. We mentioned that earlier. That's going to now have boosts on your mobile clients. And then if you uh, really want to make it nerdy, boost CLI. Although I think you got to have your own node and you got to have a command line client. So it's like, don't think of those as bad things. Just think of them as additional challenges to get your boost to the next level. Chris, I wonder, uh, will you commit to reading all the boost CLI? All right, for next week. Yeah. Yeah, all for right. next week. All right. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Because I think it's so cool. Because you got to get like a bunch of free software going to make it happen. Got a couple of picks for you this week. I have been trying out Fluffy Chat. You guys familiar with Fluffy Chat? It's one of the ones that have come up when we rattled off alternative matrix clients to element. And I thought, let's give it a go. They've got a desktop version. They've got a mobile version. It's even an F droid. It's in the uh, app store for Apple. It's in the play store for Googs. You can run it in your browser. It's also available as a flat pack and a snap. All right. So all of the bases are covered and it looks like a telegram UI on top of matrix or, or maybe a more traditional chat client. And so the idea is something other than Element to kind of make the Matrix chat experience a little more palatable. It's early, but I like it. And I think it's really, really good for um, one or two Matrix instances you're on. Uh, maybe for friends and family. Uh-huh. I can see it really useful for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, does, I, it, does it do threads? Yeah, I think so. I actually don't know if I've engaged in any threads, but I think so. Does it do encrypted DMs? Yeah, yeah, it, it does do that. And it supports spaces and that kind of stuff. Um, it's actually really, it's got, it's got most of the chat experience you want. And it is open source as well. So it's up on GitLab. And there is an F-Droid repo for it. How fluffy is it? It's pretty fluffy. Uh, I miss Element when I use it. I have to be honest. It really does get that like base experience with. I, gave, I set my wife up with Element so that way she could participate in our West Coast crew matrix room for the road trip. And I gave her Element, and it's been fine, but I realized afterwards maybe that would have been a good opportunity for Fluffy Chat because it just operates and looks more like a traditional chat client. I, I don't know how else to put it. And so if Element has been the sticky point for you in adopting Matrix, I think Fluffy Chat is worth looking at. For myself, after using Element for a while, I am no longer really suffering from those pain points that I was. I, I, my brain has made the adaptations necessary. And the Element team has made the, some of the improvements, and we just kind of met halfway. So you said pretty fluffy, but I think it's more of like a zero to cottonwood in your server kind mm. of scale today. Yeah, I'd say it's cottonwood. I'd say it's cottonwood, but not like not like jammed up your air vents so your hard drives are overheating cottonwood or plugging up your power splitters kind of cottonwood. It's just like fluffy, nice to see cottonwood going through the air, and you're like, oh, it's like it's snowing in August. <laughs> Wes, you found us a little command line tool for the learning and the... Uh, educationals. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you're trying to do some kind of spaced repetition. You've got something you're studying for. Now, there is the uh, great Anki, Anki program that maybe folks have used open source, great little powerful, intelligent flashcard system, but it can be kind of a lot sometimes if you, you know, you're the kind of person that might procrastinate by fiddling with things and <laughs> trying to set up their new tool more than just using that tool, yeah. which has happened to me before. So, uh, Try Learn, L-R-N. It's just a simple little terminal app. You can pre-fill it with a bunch of self-prepared questions or flashcards, and then you've got two modes. In the match mode, you type an answer to a question. Uh, Otherwise, you can do like a cards mode that's more like just a traditional little flashcard where you get to see the question and then flip to the answer, and you kind of decide if you knew it or not. And it's all on the command line. I'm sure you said that, but it's all on the command line, so you can just bring it up in your terminal and get to learning. That's pretty great. L-R-N. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. You can find all that at linuxunplugcom slash 471. And I'd, I'd love some suggestions for picks as well. You can send them in via the contact page, linuxunplugcom slash contact. 
or you can boost them in with your new podcast app as you do. And of course, uh, I want to invite you live. Get in here. Join us. It's it's an experience to watch us live. I mean, kind of take some of the shine off, I have to say, because, you know, it's like you can really enjoy a hot dog. But then when you go to the factory and see how they make the hot dog. Yeah, Brent won't put he just won't put on a shirt. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can take the factory tour if you like over at Jupiter.tube. Uh, we do the show live every Sunday at noon Pacific, which is like 3 p.m. East Coast time, 3 p.m. Alex time over at Jupiter.tube. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station. And a big, very hearty thank you to our members who help give us the runway to talk to the sponsors we feel are appropriate for our audience. They give us the flexibility to say no to those weird emails that come in. And of course, they help orient us from a business perspective towards our audience. You can become an Unplugged Core member over at UnpluggedCore.com or support the entire network of shows over at Jupiter.Party. And last but not least, if you'd like to contribute a bit of value in the time and talent sense, go check out new.jupiterbroadcasting.com. Get a, get a look-see on, hook your peepers on the new website, and then head over to our GitHub. And you'll find our Jupiter Broadcasting Com GitHub project and give us your feedbacks. And maybe contribute your time for your fixings and your codes. That's a thing, right? Who knows? You might just see a wild brand. You never know. And then last but not least, if you want more news, you want more Linux, you want to know what's going on in the world of open source, linuxactionnews.com. Thanks so much for joining us. See you right back here next Sunday. Breaking breaking news here, I bet. You, but I've just been informed by uh, Kenji over in the chat room that turns out me accidentally mentioning Anki, the little you know flashcard app. They're converting their Python code base to Rust. Oh so, no! Oh no! Sneaky really? last minute Rust pick can't escape it today. That's in, love that's, it. That's three different Rust drops in one show, and Linux six zero isn't even here yet. Uh, we need to follow in. We need to follow up on that uh, server update, Wes. You got your SSH session still going over there? Oh, I do. Ooh. Come on now. Don't no, you forgot all about it, didn't you? <laughs> no, no. Well, we've been because because Arch is like running Gen two. We've been building our AUR oh. helper. You know. Oh, good. You gotta. That's what you. I'm gotta glad do. we're doing the AUR updates too. Wouldn't want to miss the I mean, AUR updates. I mean, hey, DFS oh. DKMS is in there. Uh huh. That's tr actually true. Yeah. Oh right. That is a problem with the way we do it on Arch. Is the DKMS module for ZFS is in there? <laughs> it's, is it the only problem? <laughs> <laughs> so where is it at right now? Still building. <laughs> but, you know, all the main AUR updates, we did have a whole lot of uh, GPG signatures to update, so I just ended oh. up doing that in a separate step to, yeah. to before because that was going to be simpler. That is the biggest problem when you don't update an Archbox in a while, is all the GPG keys. But after that, main upgrade went totally smooth. All right, so our main upgrade's done. We're just yeah, doing we got the a new now? kernel and stuff. We're going to get some updated ZFS. I'll gotta to make sure that that's gonna build. Find out next week, I guess. <laughs>